Hello, everyone. Hi, my name is Masashi. I'm the Festival and Exhibitions Director at CAM, the Center for Asian American Media. I am so happy to be here with you all tonight. It is a beautiful San Francisco night. I'm looking up in the window. There is not one cloud. Um, we have a very special program for you all ahead of us. First off, Stephen mentioned our generous supporters. Um, I'd like to thank for this particular program, the Academy of Motion Pictures, Arts and Sciences. Um, I also want to acknowledge our uh, co-presenters. These are amaz amazing organizations who help us spread the word. So thank you to the Queer Paulettes, Queer Women of Color, Media Arts Project, Quack Map, hello, Madeline, um, and API Equality of Northern California. So thank you all. Um, do you have questions for our Spotlight Honoree, Alice Wu? If you do, we have a question box underneath the video player. So start adding your questions, and during our conversation, we'll start to ask them. I am thrilled, uh, so thrilled uh, tonight to have our Spotlight Honoree with us. So please help me give a big virtual welcome to Alice Wu. Yay. Hey, we made it. <laughs> we made it, we're both here. <laughs> Um, thank you so much for being here. And just as a starting point, congratulations on the half of it. It's such a beautiful film. We are going to talk about this film. Um, no, but before, I, yeah. yeah. No, go ahead. Oh, oh, no, thank you. I, I just, again, wanted to say, and I think you know this, how deeply grateful I've been to CAM all these years, you know, I, and I truly believe I would never have been a filmmaker if CAM didn't exist. There are a lot of things, like I remembered CAM when it was still NATA, you know, oh, it was yeah. kind of a different name. So, so when you asked or you're, you know, I was overjoyed to get to be part of this. So thank you so much for having me. Well, thank you. And yeah, for the audience to know, you know, we've been talking to Alice for many months now. Um, and before it was virtual, it was going to be in person, and we had all these different ideas. And you know, even in the most busy of times, Alice was really fast to respond and really passionate. So I really want to thank you for uh, being so enthusiastic about this. Um, oh no, you're my hometown festival. <laughs> aw. Um, before we start, there's a pandemic happening. So I just curious, how are you doing? How's your family doing during these hard times? Oh, no, thank you for asking. Um, yeah. So we're all, I mean, especially compared to, I think, you know, what is happening out there, I think we're all, we're well, we're lucky we're all, I'm very strictly sheltered in place because I'm worried about getting my mom sick. And I think the hardest thing for me is not being able to see her. Uh, she lives, I mean, it's so ironic. I moved here to, you know, 10 years ago to be closer to her because of her health. And now, like, it, it's that thing where I'm glad I'm a car ride away. Like, if there's any emergency, I can get there. But to keep her safe, I'm actually staying away from her, but then also staying very sheltered. And she's, thank God, it, it took a lot, as I know many of us had. But now she's been really, like, staying. Like, she doesn't leave, you know, the house. And it, it's all been, so, so far, knock on wood. But, uh, uh, yeah, yeah, it's, um, it's confusing times. Yeah. Um. Before we talk about the half of it, I want to go chronological and talk about Saving Face, uh, a movie that, as you know, is so important to Asian American cinema, also to CAM. came out in 2004. Are you okay if we start there? Have a yeah, few questions? of course. Okay, great. Yeah, yeah. Um, so Saving Face is still one of our most referenced and requested films from our audiences. And as an example, we did an event with comedian Ali Wong a few months ago, and she mentioned Saving Face was a big influence on her. Um, and so now that we're about 15 years-ish later, I'm curious why you think the film resonates with audiences still. Yeah, I, so I, I love that question. I wanna answer it, but <laughs> just about Ali Wong, just cause it's so funny to me. When that happened, somehow we ended up exchanging direct messages over Twitter and I confessed to her, I don't know, this might've been like three or four years ago. I was at Great <laughs> China, which is a Chinese restaurant in Berkeley. Um, I'd just seen a play and I was at Great China with a friend and I literally looked over and Ali Wong was sitting there like eating wow. a big mess of spare ribs. And I was just like, and I actually literally was like, oh my God, oh my God. But I was too shy to say anything to her. So I surreptitiously took a photo like a total weirdo. <laughs> um, and then, you know, and then I left. And years later, I like went, I wrote like, this is going to sound ridiculous. She's like, why don't you come up and say hi? And I'm like, why would I do that? Like, I'm not going to go up to a random celebrity, be like, hi, you don't know me. But, but so it was like a total thrill for me that she name checked uh, that, you know, saving face and that yeah. it was somehow um, important to her when she was younger. Yeah. Oh, and then so your question, yeah. your question yeah. is about 
why I think it resonates. You know, honestly, I was really surprised to find out um, because, well, well, here's the thing, you know, like through all these years, like I left the industry 10 years ago and thought I, you know, like I lived in San Francisco and I honestly, I, like I knew there was a very rabid fan base for Saving Face, but I thought it was very small. I literally thought, okay, it's like going to be my friends, probably everyone my friends have ever dated, maybe everyone those people have ever dated and that's it, right? Like, and then like a random straight guy or something. <laughs> like, <laughs> like, I was like, that's probably what it is. Um, but every now and then periodically, like I'm very active in the queer Asian community in San Francisco. And every now and then I'll be at an event and someone will come up and be, tell me how much the film meant to them, but they'll be like 19 years old. And I'll be like, they'll have like just watched the film like last month or last year. And I'll be like, you were four when this film came out. Like, how is this a possibility? And so that part surprises me. But I also thought it must just be for queer Asians. Mm -hmm. But when the half of it came out, or it was announced it was coming out, I think that was a big shocker for me to find out. You know, being someone who doesn't know a lot about social media, I've hardly ever been on social media until the last few months. Because for Netflix, they're big. You know, a lot of the ways they get the word out is through social media. Um, and all of a sudden, I just discovered this whole, like, there just is a much larger group than I realized, um, who somehow still held on to that film as relevant and important. Um, and I, I mean, I, on the one hand, as an artist, I feel incredibly honored, right? Like, you want to feel like your work stands the test of time. But it's also mixed for me, because it mm. also makes me feel like it, it makes me wonder if there are fewer, like, you know, if there are just fewer films between then and now than I might have wanted. Um, and, you know, and since then, you know, like, I love The Farewell, you know, I love Crazy Rich Asians, I love Searching. Um, there's like a book, you know, there, there's so many, like Justin Chong, Gook, you know, there's so many amazing films, all of which are all different from each other, right? And so I'm glad that all these filmmakers are out there. Um, but it's still not a critical mass. Um, mm -hmm. And I, I think that always makes me a little bit uh, sad, but I also feel like it's accelerating. You know, mm -hmm. like I've met a yeah. lot of uh, new voices here and I feel like we're at a place where people are starting to do it for themselves. So I feel like we're at the precipice of right. when so many voices are gonna really break out um, and already have, but are really gonna do so in the next few years. That's wonderful. Yeah. And that actually goes into my next question. You know, I, I heard you in an interview say while you were writing Saving Face, you didn't know if it was going to be made, you know, an Asian American oh, no. feature linked lesbian love story. And you, you did get the film made. And I know that to your point, there's a lot of people out there who want to tell stories of community of color, LGBTQ stories. And what would you tell them who are people who are writing scripts right now who may not know if their films are going to be made? Like, what advice would you give them? Yeah, I, I, you know, and I think everyone is different. So you should take this as a grain of salt. Like this is me. I think I spook myself very easily. So it's really mm. best if I like it. Uh, well, first of all, obviously the point of starting Saving Face, never having gone to film school or ever written a script at all, or even thought about being a filmmaker, it would have been bonkers for me to think that this thing I was writing wasn't get made. Like this was, you know, like that thing came out 15 years ago. I was writing it like 20 years ago. Like in what universe would I have been like, oh yes, this is a shoe in <laughs> you know, like, like the, um, so, but I think it's incredibly freeing, right? Uh, and similarly, when I wrote the half of it, I'd already left the industry. So at the point I was writing the half of it, I also didn't think it was gonna get made. I thought mm. like it probably was gonna be easier to get made than Saving Face. But I also thought, well, I've decided to make main character Chinese. It's probably gonna take another five years. It might, not, you know, but that is a very freeing thought. And I think, I mean, there, there's two, two things. One is, are you trying to make something just to break into the industry? Because what you want to be is like a writer in the industry. That's one thought, right? Um, I happen to come from it from a totally different way, which is that I don't feel the need to make films. Like, I don't feel like, oh, I'm a filmmaker. I must make films. I'm very project specific. So if I read something or I've written something and I'm like, I love this, then I will like move heaven and earth to try and get it done, right? But if that thing doesn't exist, I, w I won't. So what that means then, like for me to feel that level of devotion, I think I have to write from such a personal 
place that I need to sort of shut out any thought of like, what will the audience think? Like not even what will the Asian lesbian audience think, right? Like that'll, that can also be crippling because I already know that as I'm writing this, it's like, I'll be like, oh, they probably won't like this. But the thing is you, you can't, like the, I think that's just a dangerous thought to have because A, you don't know what people are gonna like when they don't like, no one has that power. But B, you're trying to write characters that feel like real humans, right? right. And real humans are confusing and messy and I think we tend to relate to people not because they're so wonderful and brilliant. We tend to relate to them because they are messy and flawed, right? Um, and and to let your like to get there for me at least, I kind of have to sort of have this moment where I'm really just writing for the characters. Like I'm really, or sometimes I'm writing for one person. Like I wrote Saving Face for my mom, mm -hmm. right? Like like there's a part of me. It's not like I'm thinking, what is my mom gonna think of this scene? Because she'd probably hate it, and I get lots of notes. But if I just can, like if I write knowing that it's like the emotion I'm trying to express, like there's something very real there. By the time I'm done. I have a shot at her seeing it and being moved, right? And then like the, so I don't know if that makes sense, but I, I guess Definitely. I would just say, don't put the pressure on yourself of succeeding. Like, you know, if what you're trying to do is to do something that will move people, then try and move yourself first. Hmm. That's great. Um, we, uh, there are so many questions from the audience. This is exciting. I, I've never seen questions come in so much or so rapidly. Um, I think are they all start... from squirrels like we had discussed earlier? There's a few about uh, nuts and where to hide yes, them. Yes, that's but... what we thought. Masashi <laughs> and I were all like, what if 20% of the people here are actually squirrels who just clicked on this by accident? <laughs> and like, I'm like, I want that to be true. <laughs> it would be pretty epic. Um, so I'm going to go to our first question from the audience, which is a video question. So let's oh. bring them in. Yeah. There's a video question. Yes. Jeez. Oh my God. How is woo? What is, oh my God, oh my God. Yay. Surprise. Oh my God. You can't imagine the work it took to coordinate this. <laughs> We're not Lauren and Marky and Jonathan. <laughs> Who are they? No, you didn't Those even know. Those are fake names. <laughs> uh, we, everyone's been here for a while now, kind of in the shadows, so. We've been here, Disney. I've been in the top corners watching you talk about squirrels. We've been Listening to our squirrel talk. Um, there so, was no, it didn't, it just said me and Masashi. There didn't have any other <laughs> names, so I didn't even know. They didn't show up. I think so, if you don't have video, you, you don't know, show up. It took me so much energy to get rid of my picture or idea. <laughs> they, they were trying so hard to teach me, and I'm like so stupid. <laughs> I, I was, I was half-dressed on the phone with Joan and on you, listening to you on mute. <laughs> Oh my God, I, I honestly, I'm just so, I kind of wish you could end this panel so I could just talk to these people. I'm so sorry, <laughs> audience, but I'm actually like, I kind of want to cry. Oh, so, so I do want to catch up the audience who may not know what's going on here. We are so excited to have a surprise <laughs> Saving Face virtual reunion. We have uh, Lin Chen who plays Vivian. We have Michelle Kruzik who plays Will. We have Will's lovely mother, played by the one and only Joan Chen. So welcome, you're all here now. Thank you so I, much I, for participating. I um, can't believe anyone doesn't know what's going on because all three of these people I are know. more famous than me. I so know. it's like, yeah, no, I, we, I honestly- we, we, we knew last week already. <laughs> oh, <laughs> oh man. Well, why did, this is amazing. While we have people, uh, everyone here, just any, you know, we just talked about Saving Face 15 years ago. Any reflections from anyone and being part of this beloved uh, film? I was just taking notes on, on what you just said, Alice, you know, about the characters and relatability. I mean, I just feel like uh, when I listen to you talk, I, I fall in love with filmmaking. So anyway, sorry, that's just oh. me. <laughs> I just, I just want to cry with, with you. you. <laughs> Well, I know we're coming up on um, like our anniversary. Alice, oh. you're talking about the more fans that you have. Honestly, I, I went to China. I have a lot of Chinese fans who have seen it. They love yeah. Oh, yeah. Yeah. No, it, it's it's uh, uh, yeah. No, I I sorry. I'm just speechless right now because I'm just so happy to see your faces. I know the one drawback is we were 
talking earlier about some kind of way we can all do a celebratory happy everything after this. So maybe we can figure it out. We can still continue the celebrations afterwards. Um, so, you know, we have everyone here and, uh, you know, it's exciting because it is 15 years later and I've been so excited to see everyone on screen here do so many exciting things and from thinking of 2004 to now and there's a lot of things just Quickly noting, Lynn, you did direct and star in our opening night film, I Will Make You Mine. That beautiful film, yes, congratulations, is going to be released next week on Blu-ray VOD. So May 26, right? So people can yeah, check that out. Yeah, the day after um, the 15-year release of Saving Face. Yeah, oh, wow. And my distributor said, what do you think of May 26? I was like, that's a good day. <laughs> I think it's actually the day before. I think May 27th is the release of a, oh, wow. yeah. I, I saw Lynn's film already and it's, it's really marvelous. So if there's anyone out there who has it, um, I, I strongly urge you to see it. Yes. Michelle, you are in so many things, but you recently were in Netflix show Hollywood starring Asian American film icon, Anime Wong. So congratulations. You did a really wonderful job. Thank you. Thank Good you. Oh, yeah. Oh, I love that. <laughs> and Joan, I, you know, I know that we played some of the films that you have directed in the last few years. Um, you also are in films, Alan Yang's Tiger Tail. You have a fun cameo in the half of it. I don't know if everyone <laughs> notices that. I'm the prop, yes. <laughs> I, I, I can't stay away from Alice, yeah. No, she's going to be in everything. Even like, I'm just going to have to find a way to like, yeah. No, I, I, uh, uh, it, that was, Joan was so generous of me. And I was like, oh, and she sent me all these amazing photos uh, and was so generous to let me use her as like, it's like a fun Easter egg for, uh, for <laughs> Saving Face fans. Yeah. Um, thank you. So, um, oh, and also just quickly about Michelle, like yeah. I actually cried watching Michelle play Anna Mae Wong and it made me, it was just very hard not to feel the parallels mm. of, I mean, sorry, tell me Michelle if this is inappropriate to say, is it okay? If I, yeah, just, you're going to make me cry too, but go ahead. Yeah. <laughs> no, just as I was watching, cause you asked me earlier about, did I think there'd be more films in between? And funnily, someone just asked me this today on a podcast and I started talking about how I really felt it is that when Saving Face came out, I was just like, if there was one thing I was betting on for sure, it was that my actors were all going to get incredible roles, lead roles. They were all superstars. They were all going to be like, like I was so positive and it was actually something that not, I mean, they did, they were working, they were doing really interesting things with their lives. But from my perspective, I didn't feel like they were getting the opportunities they absolutely deserved uh, because I just didn't think, again, this, I, I didn't think the industry was ready then to, to give them the fully fleshed leads that they, they should have, you know? And so it was like one of those things that was always crushing for me. Um, and then like watching that, I don't know, it was just really hard. Like I just started crying, <laughs> like watching, like even though I know like you're not anime Wong, you're not a boozy actress, you're not like, but that thing of like, you know, it, like, yeah. But then at the same time, you guys have all like, you found amazing work, you're all direct. I mean, Joan was already directing, but like Lynn and Michelle, you're both directing now. So it, you know, maybe it worked out okay. I just, yeah, I don't know. It was something that, that I, for many years, uh, uh, you, you were ahead of your time, Alice. You were ahead uh, of your time. Yeah, I, I no, guess I we mean, all were, just imagine, right? Just imagine Savings Face being released today, right? Mm. It, it would have done it would have, but you know what? You guys might, I, I, I'm so glad that film came out then because if it came out today, we, yeah, yeah. it wouldn't be you guys in it, right? I cannot imagine that film without you guys. Like, I think that film needed to come out, it did. I do think it, like, I mean, you can tell me if I'm wrong. I know, Joan, you told me that like until Saving Face, people did not realize you could do comedy, which I thought was so hilarious because you're one of the funniest people I know. But because you had like, you know, you're up for these Oscar winning, like wrote, like people thought you were like in Chinese films are so dramatic. You're so, and you're an incredible dramatic actress. And then all of a sudden you got to do this, like, and people are like, oh, and, and it's bonkers to me. They did not know that. But I thought that that was like a wonderful Thing. And then again, Lynn, that was the first script you read. So I like to think that that helped propel you on your journey to like move to LA. And, you know, Michelle was like, I think it was the first one you got to be the lead in, right, Michelle? Yeah. Yeah. So I like to think, even though I'm mad about the, the, 
I'm, I'm mad about how hard the industry made it for, I, I'm very proud of the fact that you guys did what you did and that we're all still here today, right? I think that that's so. I saw Saving Face just probably about a week, two weeks ago or something, you know, with, with Audrey, with my daughter, and she loved it. She loved it. That was her first time. Yeah. Yeah, she was like two or yeah. something when we were going around with that film, right? She was, she was less than two. Yeah, she was less than two. Yeah, I remember we went to Disney World and she ate that gigantic yeah, turkey well, drumstick. Right, so she's about two then. She was in New York too, yeah, yeah. Yeah, so happy that we made it together, right? Right, girls? Yeah. I, I saw it recent. well, I didn't see it recently, but the last time I saw it on, on screen, I also had the same reaction as like, we were such babies. And even though at that time it wasn't guerrilla filmmaking, doesn't it felt to me like somehow it was so pioneering what had happened. Um, so, you know, it's, it's, uh, it's really been an inspiration for me to this day. And I think watching you go through your process um, now as a, as a friend and witnessing how you approach your work, which doesn't feel like you're trying to be derivative or that you're trying to produce work for the sake of producing work has been, it has, has allowed me to transition into directing as a way of saying, Alice clearly knows when she wants to apply her voice as opposed to just trying to throw everything at it and just see what you come up with, you know? And so for me, being yeah. part of this family has allowed me to grow in so many different ways. So uh -huh. this, that, the last 15 years almost feels like, you know, one giant chapter and, and I, I, I have a lot to thank you for, basically. I think it's so well said. It's so well said. We all feel this way, Alice. Oh, oh no. <laughs> it's, it's something we all did together. Like, thank God for you guys, you know? And um, I mean, they all know, like, it's funny, like I left the industry 10 years ago and I really didn't write at all. I don't think I wrote a word for six years and I thought I'd left for good. Um, and, but somehow like these people all stayed my friends, you know, we all still, well, Joan and I both live in San Francisco. So I saw her much more regularly. I watched her daughters grow up, but then, you know, Michelle and Lynn, if I went to LA or we've met in Vegas before. <laughs> like, um, yeah, I, 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 I felt very grateful that you guys were all friends had nothing to do with work. I mean, we've met cause of work, but it wasn't, yeah. Um, I, I think, I think, yeah, we're definitely a family. So, so thank you. Well, it's been about 15 years. So I'm assuming there's no sequel to Saving Face. But my question would be for people um, here, where do you think your characters would be? If there was a sequel, uh, sequel in 2020, I guess Will would be very busy working in the hospital. But any thoughts on where you think your character might be at? My God, I would have a son or daughter. Uh, Alice, would it be a boy or girl? <laughs> <laughs> I, I think it'd be a girl. <laughs> yeah, so I'd be I'd be raising a what fifteen year old girl <laughs> right now. <laughs> yeah. Wow. Yep. I think it would. I think my take would be that somehow uh, Will has decided to maybe Vivian has decided she's want to have she wants to have a kid, <laughs> and that kid might be of a certain age, and then suddenly there's the question of how to apply gender politics into today's modern age and how to deal with identity and, you know, to make that kind of uh, part of the, part of the conversation piece of how, how to be, how to be queer in this day and age. <laughs> ah, I honestly haven't thought about it, even though everyone's always asking about a sequel, because there's a part of me that just wishes that it would happen. And then I can just latch on to whatever story Alice wants to make, um, instead of like planting ideas in her head. Um, other, and also, you know, I just love these characters so much that part of me like, likes to think of them like under glass, <laughs> undisturbed. Um, until they, they're reawakened. I'm a big fan of sequels 10, <laughs> 10 years later, so. Yeah, I think Alice did it for, wrote it for your mother, yeah? It's done. Yeah. Yeah. I wrote it for my mom, but the other thing is, so I'm not a fan of sequels unless the sequel 
it, unless it's planned, like in, in the case of, for example, something's planned as a trilogy, that's a different thing, right? But I'm not a fan of sequels just because like, oh, that was great. Let's just hang out more, right? Like I actually think if the film was planned to end, um, then the only reason to do a sequel is you have a whole nother specific story that in and of itself, if the first film didn't exist, would be the best and most beautifully told in that, that way. That's the reason to do it. Um, otherwise, it, I sometimes think it can inadvertently slightly tarnish what well, kind of what Lynn said so beautifully. Like there, I think people relate to this film. And then even though they're telling you, we want to know exactly what's happening. Part of why they're relating to it is they put themselves in it, right? Like they, they, there's a connection. So now if it's like, well, this happens and all of a sudden they're like, well, that's not quite what I, like now the connection starts to fray a little bit, right? Like if you've done your job, um, then on some level, the sequel or the continuation is what, what the dialogue is in everyone's head after the film. Like that's how a film lives on. And you asked me earlier about why do I think this film still has resonance? I think the fact that it has resonance means a lot of different people brought themselves to it and they feel like it, it makes them feel a certain way, right? And I want, I don't know, I, I think that's important. And I think it's, I, I prefer to hold space for that. And, and I swear it's not a cop out. Like if I thought there was like a brilliant idea that would be best told, uh, then I'd be like, absolutely, let's do a sequel. I, I just, otherwise I feel like, oh, it starts to, you know, it's like, well, you'll be watching certain TV series and they just like continue on. And after a while you're like, why are we still like, I guess I like these characters. So I'm still watching, but it's starting to like, yeah, you start to lose the magic. Uh, I think, you know, Alice stopped writing uh, for so long uh, for a reason. She, she must have this strong urge to tell a new story, right? Mm -hmm. I mean, not the sequel type. I don't think you're ever the sequel type. I think not if I haven't planned it in. Yeah. <laughs> Yeah. If I plan something as a trilogy, that's a different thing. Yeah. yeah. Like, you know, like, again, Lynn's fit like that, I think, is planned as like a, like, that's a different kind of thing. Yeah. I feel like the half of it is, it's not a sequel, but I feel like there's a prequel a or, or even a, or even a prequel, but I do feel like there is a, a conversation that's happening between the two films. Uh, uh, so whether that's conscious, whether it's conscious or not watching the two films i felt like there's a conversation happening about love yes i i think that just reflects where i am in my life uh yeah. and what i think about um i mean honestly on this trajectory apparently the next time i'll release a film i'll be 65 and it'll be about like an eight-year-old like a little asian baby dyke or something like apparently that's the geometric or <laughs> I guess it's a linear progression I'm on, but the, uh, uh, but yeah, I, I think, you know, Saving Face was like trying to make the biggest romantic comedy I could using all Asian faces on a tiny budget, right? So that, that in and of itself is like, because I didn't feel like I ever got to see that. I just, you know, having grown up weaned on romantic comedies, I'd never really got to see that for Asian Americans, for queers, and then certainly not for queer Asian Americans in that notion of the happy ending at the time was weirdly controversial. But the great thing is now, now nobody thinks it's too happy. Everyone's like, of course, because the world changed, right? And the half of it, I think, is about, you know, I, I just, uh, having been so like, oh, once you find your other half, your life is complete. I think just over the years, um, I'm realizing that like, it's a wonderful thing to find someone that you want to spend your life with. But even if that happens, and even when I look at all my friends and the people that they're with, right? And even when they're in wonderful relationships, it really doesn't seem like then their life just sort of ends in this like wonderful sort of happy ending and swelling music and then nothing more happens. It seems like that, that's a piece. And then their life continues on with the trials and tribulations. And I kind of wonder if it's just getting older. Like in your twenties, it makes sense to be like, oh, thank God, find that person, you're done. But I think when you get to your 30s, you get to your 40s, and you start to see all the different ways that love affects you in your life. And you start to, like, I just start wondering, like, huh, is romantic love really the most important love? Because it feels like all these movies and these books make that the case. And if instead you think, you know, like, maybe it is wonderful, but it's one of many. And that's when I started thinking about, like, platonic love and the love between, you know, the family. And I think the half of it's, in a way, my attempt to talk about 
that where it's like it starts off teasing you with will you find you know who's going to get the girl but it really turns out to be more about a journey of self-discovery well, like do that that oh. friendship is so sweet it's the sweetest mm -hmm. friendship the most unlikely friendship it's just it's such a beautiful friendship between the two of them i really enjoyed that oh thank yeah. you um, well i do want to move you know we just had a walk yeah, people watch the half of it. So I do want to move into more questions that I have. And there are so many questions from audience, which is great about the half of it. So I, I just want to thank again, all of everyone for jumping. This is so exciting. Wait, are they leaving? Do you all want to, you can stay if you want, if you, and you can help me uh, co-moderate if you want, if you have your own questions, it's up to you if you want to stay or if you want. I, I am so happy to see you, Alice. And I, I love everything that I'm seeing online with all the outpouring of support for the half of it. And I, I want to give you your space and your time and my kids have to go to bed. <laughs> <laughs> but I, I, I can't tell you I, how much it is. It makes me so happy to see you every time, but to have the three to four of us with Cam, really, you guys are so influential. Thank you so much for everything you do. Um, I'm emotional because I know so, it's just so it's great. so weird. I happened to text you guys this morning having zero idea that I was going to see you. I was just like, I finally last night had some time because I was like, I'm blocking out time. And then I then this morning I was like, oh, I'm going to check. And I, sorry, I guess not the whole audience doesn't need to understand how terrible <laughs> I am. At but the point is, the point is like, this makes me go like, maybe this weekend we should all hop on a Zoom or something. Um, yeah. Okay. Yeah. All right. Hey. Okay. Okay. Thank okay. you. Right. So Thank you all, all so much. I'm gonna go see Hollywood now. I'm gonna go see Hollywood. <laughs> okay, do it. <laughs> episode two and the last episode in particular. Sorry. Which one? Episode two. That's the, okay. that's the ones Michelle's really like. Yeah, that's the key part of her story. Okay. All right. Okay. Bye. Bye. Thank you all. Bye. Bye. Cam. All right. Uh, oh my god. <laughs> oh my god. Wow. Um, yeah, what do you, okay, so let's continue on with the half of it. You know, you shot it about a year ago. So I am, are you still processing a little yes, bit? Yes, I'm still, <laughs> Sorry, I no, I'm listening, right I'm listening, sorry. Is my, I can't, I always unpin, so I can't see myself. Does my uh -huh. face look like horrified or dazed <laughs> or like, I mean, not horrified, but do I look sort of like stunned? Um, that was amazing. Thank you so much for doing that. Oh, that was course. really amazing. Well, and for the audience, you know, we did talk about for your spotlight at Campfest, we were going to do a screening of Saving Face. And it was our, I, you know, we talked about bringing everyone together as well to do a reunion. So it's not the same as uh, that in person experience we were hoping to have, but this is, you know, this is still pretty it's good. It's the and, next, it's the best thing that we could yeah. do now. But that said, I still hope someday we can still do that. Maybe at the 20 year. I don't know. Yeah. Well, the, uh, but I hope we get to. Uh, or at a, maybe in the near future at a drive-in or something. In oh my God, that would be amazing. <laughs> okay, we'll talk about it. I just want to get that. Leah. I just want to get like all my babies together. <laughs> um, all right, so for the half of it, you filmed this about a year ago. You know, this is your next feature. Can you just talk about this film as a kind of a year later, how you feel about it? Yeah. So it's funny. This was, it's funny. I was just talking to a producer of mine and we're like, wow, this is an accelerated, accelerated yeah. thing. Like, I don't think people realize how, like I started writing the half of it a little over three years ago. I kind of went out with it about just over two years ago and then like found financing within like five months and then like took like three or four months to decide. And then I was like off and running and it was basically like a you know, like we were in pre-production starting the end of January last year. Um, and like, it was like a mad sprint so that the creative part for me was done by middle of December. Um, and I don't think people realize, like it was, you know, we shot for 28 days. The whole thing was just like, there was like, I don't think I had a weekend off. I had like two days off on Thanksgiving, um, but I worked two days at Thanksgiving holiday. Like everything was just, uh, and then, um, yeah. And then I, you know, we finished the final, like they had to finish some post stuff in the last couple months. And here we were. It, it's, uh, so I, I, I actually was just saying to a, a friend of mine that I, I not even had time to process any of this. Like I honestly thought two things. I thought, oh God, when I discovered there was this like surprising base of lesbian fans or whatever fans of Saving Face, I immediately, who were all texting or tweeting things like, 
I trust Alice Wu with my life. And I was like, please do not. <laughs> like, that's like a <laughs> terrible idea. And like someone wrote like, I, I think I kept getting this thing where someone's like, someone wrote, I trust Alice Wu to give all the gays everything they want. And I was like, I can barely figure out how to give one gay some of what they want, let alone like all gays, everything they want. Like there's zero, ch I totally thought this movie's gonna come out. I'm gonna be like raked over the coal. Because as you asked me earlier, how do I write? I don't write thinking about the audience or critics. I literally write whatever I personally feel seems right in that moment because I've convinced myself it's not gonna get made. Mm. And I think that, um, yeah, I, I think that's really part of the reason why it's so bizarre for me right now that so many different people seem to have embraced the film. And I can't tell whether they're just, like, I, I'm sure some people don't like it. And, you know, and I know there are people I'm sure who are disappointed. And that's, by the way, totally fair. You know, like not every film is going to, like, I, I guess what I'm saying is that I'm glad when someone feels disappointed because it means that they wanted something and the thing they wanted is really valid to have, right? And especially if they're queer or they're Asian, like the more people can feel like they des they should, you know, they deserve to get that thing they want, that they want to see. This might not be the film. Like, mm. you know, I have my reasons why I think this film should be the way it is, but the fact that they want that I think is progress, right? Mm. And then hopefully they'll make a film or someone else will make a film that will address that. Um, but I guess these are the thoughts that go through my head is I, yeah. I, I think I'll probably need to just take a break after and just absorb what's happened and then probably go off on a, well, I can't now because of the pandemic, but I would normally go <laughs> off on a long road trip and like realis myself. Yeah. Well, and you know, that might be true, but also, you know, the film has a 96% on Rotten Tomatoes. It's getting a lot of positive reviews from critics and audiences, which is, I'm sure, very exciting. You know, one of the things that we talked about earlier was when Saving Face came out, there wasn't really no social media, or is at least at the beginning of social media. So now when this film comes out on Netflix, you're seeing people on YouTube creating their own videos. I now know how to make a taco uh, sausage. You know, all of these, there's all these creative things that come out of your own creative thing. And I'm fascinated for you as a filmmaker, do you like seeing all of the people taking it and making their own content out of it. Oh, what is I love it like it. for you? Yeah. I love it. I mean, the fan art has been phenomenal, you know, or people singing the songs, like, you know, people send, and I, I, I mean, as I'm not a big social media person and I just want people to know if I suddenly drop off the face of the earth and I'm not listening or answering things, it's not personal. It's just, I myself am not, a, I don't know if I can process that much, but I'm just constantly moved every time. And I do, like I always listen to everything when people send it to me. I might not be able to respond to it all. Um, but I think that's part of the conversation I was telling you about earlier when I'm like, you put a film out there and then it's not yours. You know, it's like you, you work on it, you work on it and work on it, but once you release it, it it's, it's everyone else's, right? And so it's wherever they take it. And for me, that's the most interesting thing. It's where they take it in their, their mind. and. I love that for the half of it, for whatever reasons, where they've taken it is a lot of creativity, whether it's visual, um, whether it's musical, you know, people have written things. Um, and, and yeah, I, I, uh, uh, there's fan fiction out there, which, you know, I, by the way, go to town on the fan fiction. I'm all for that. The, uh, um, yeah, I, 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 I like, if that helps make people then start to tell their story, then I, I don't know what could be better as like a artist. Um, okay, I, I need to start to ask these audience questions or I'm, we're gonna be here all Are they gonna night. rebel? <laughs> <laughs> yeah. These squirrels are gonna be angry. <laughs> okay, uh, this one's exciting. I wanna start with Cam's board co-chair and your friend Dipti Ghosh. So she submitted ah. a Yay. So she submitted a question um, and comments. She, so she said, um, as a 65 year old lesbian, this film takes me back beautifully to my own teenage awkward days of figuring things out. Another confession, I am a sucker for coming of age stories and this one is especially well done. I love the poignant images of first generation families. Even though this is set in a quaint small town, the story is universal. What compelled Alice to set the story in a small town? And secondly, um, a message from her friends on behalf of Friends Camp. I want to say a big congratulations and we are happy for your success. Never doubted it ever. So 
I, they're honest. I love Diff D and friends, big shout out to friends camp who also, I think in my credits, cause I, when I was writing my first draft, like in, in the middle of writing my first draft, I went to friends camp, which is just this yearly group of like old cranky queer dykes <laughs> gathered <laughs> together. Um, the, uh, 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 or I'll speak for myself. Everyone else is young and stunningly attractive, but the, uh, I, I, her, her, I, um, sorry, I'm still so moved by by everything. Actually, uh, let me. Okay, get it together, Alice. <laughs> so the question is, why did I write this? Or set this in a small rural town. Mm -hmm. um, when I started writing this, uh, Trump had just been elected. Um, I sat down to write, and I spent a good six months not writing at all. I literally, like everyone else I knew, just started googling endlessly about Trump. Um, like everyone else I knew, I was devastated. Uh, and I think somewhere in there, um, I realized that like, oh, I should set the story in, you know, a small rural town, some, a place that might be Trump country. I don't say it's Trump country because I don't want to date the film. I, I'd love this film to have a timeless relevance where you could watch it 15 years from now and it still holds up in some way, right? And I think that um, the reason for that is, you know, I, I didn't want to make this I didn't want to make this like a period piece where it's like, here is a young high school lesbian coming out in the 90s as if homophobia and xenophobia and racism don't exist today, right? And so that's a lot of why I thought like, okay, you know, where in the country would that make sense? But a lot, but more than that, it had to do with the fact that I just, I don't know, like I, 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 I was so startled that there were so many sections of the country that you know, like, of course I knew that we all have a lot of work to do, you know, in, in sexism, racism, xenophobia, transphobia. But I thought we were progressing as a country. Like somewhere I bought into this sort of idea that we were getting better and that like I was working on it within myself. I was getting better. Everyone else was doing that. Um, and to find out there are whole sections of the country that felt deeply resentful about being asked to work on that um, really threw me. Um, and I can't help but feel like it has to do with, I, I, I think, you know, and this has a lot to do with growing up in a small conservative Chinese family where I, I realized that like, oh, someone can have, you know, someone can be homophobic or racist or sexist and still actually be a decent person because I've watched my family be like that and myself, right? Like I'm an old Asian dyke, but it's not like I wasn't sexist and racist and homophobic growing up. I truly don't think it's possible to be an American born in this country and not have had those attitudes so imbued in you that we all, we're, we're all constantly working on it. So if that's the case, I thought by setting this there and in particular using the character of Paul, who I think, you know, maybe you first see Paul and you're kind of like, who's this guy? But then, I think through the course of the film, you fall in love with Paul. Like he's so lovable. And then all of a sudden he breaks your heart, right? Like close to the end, he does something that breaks your heart. And that was important for me to show because I think a lot of people will meet it like, oh my God, how could he say like, and then the next thought is, oh, someone could have an attitude that hurts you and still be a good person. And I wanted to show that. Mm -hmm. And then I want to show how he, essentially reaches outside himself and his beliefs because of love for his friend, right? And I think that's why people change. Um, and the interesting thing is why I went with Netflix, because my other two options would have involved more theatrical, like specialty theatrical. But I thought, well, I'm going to, I'm trying to reach communities that are definitely never going to a landmark theater, but are probably not going to go to the theater to see this film, even if it was a wide release, right? And what was fascinating is that Netflix wanted to test screen this film, and I'd never test screened a film before. Um, so they test screened it. One of the places is in a very conservative suburb uh, in Arizona. And it was this place, literally, there were like Maga hats in the audience. There was like one restaurant that was an Outback Steakhouse that I went to for lunch with my exec. And the sign was like, we love your guns, but please don't bring your guns in the Outback. And I'm like, where am I? And so I was totally freaked out sitting in this audience of like 200, you know, pretty much predominantly white people. But then we got the surveys back. And what was shocking is that it tested like as well as it did in New York City. In fact, it even tested a couple points better. And how many people marked that they were conservative, but still marked the film excellent 
but then when asked, would you recommend this film to a friend, said no, because I'm okay with this, but my friends would not be. Mm. And that to me tells me people are changing. They're just like weirdly closeted about the fact that they're changing their attitudes, right? Um, so that, that's sort of, for me, then that moment, that felt like a good, like, thank God I went off Netflix. Like the, that, that was a, sorry, it was a very long answer. But that's, the, <laughs> that's okay. Um, there is, I'm trying to consolidate a whole lot of the questions into, so I apologize if I don't give particular names. There's a lot of love for the film and just a lot of people thanking you so much for making it. There's a lot of questions about the casting. There, uh, there's different questions on different uh, main characters and just being so impressed by them. So can you take maybe uh, a few minutes to talk about your cast? Yes, yeah, I, I love those kids. Um, so I was very adamant that I was gonna cast fresh faces. Like I said up front, I, I think I'm pretty difficult to cast for because I'm so specific about what I want and I was that way with Saving Face where like I'm sure I, like for years after Saving Face, there couldn't be like a KFC commercial, with, like an Asian face in it where I had not read that person. And it's like, I was just like not gonna make the film until I found the perfect people. And I found that in Michelle and Lynn and Joan, right? And, but with the half of it, it was same principle again, but even more so, um, I really wanted, uh, uh, like I think in Saving Face, which is a romantic comedy, I could have a star like Joan Chan because there's something about that, that particular uh, genre that, that can hold that kind of star power. I think for the half of it, it's not that like you can't have a star in it, but in this case, I was making a more naturalistic film. Like it's, it's not really a romantic comedy. It's like a coming of age of romantic comedy elements, but then it gets subverted in the middle, right? So there's something a little more naturalistic in the style and the tone. And I really needed us to believe these three kids exist. And the way to do that is not to have that boy that everyone recognizes in the lead of that CW show, right? Like, or, oh, it's so-and-so from, you know, this. What, how to do that is to get people that people have not seen before. So you start to buy that these kids are real, right? Um, and so I just, I must have read like 500 people for like all three of those roles wow. until I found the people I wanted. And so Leah, um, and by the way, all three of them, I'm convinced after this film, like my whole thing is after the film, I, I do think all three of them are stars. And I think all three of them, if there's any justice, um, are going to have really big careers. Uh, and then maybe because I especially feel invested, you know, because of what happened after Saving Face, where, you know, I just, I a thousand percent thought, I mean, Joan was already a star, but I a thousand percent thought Michelle and Lynn were going to be like the next Kate Winslet's and the next, you know, and... And there's still time for them to do that, but I thought it was going to happen fast, you know? And, and so I, I, I do, like with Leah, I mean, they're all three so talented. It's just, I, I'm going to just be open and confess the fact that like, look, she's also Asian American and I think it's really time, you know? And I think Leah is so talented. Uh, when she came through the door, her instincts were not right for the character because Leah herself is nothing like Ellie on the surface. Like Leah's sing, she dances. She's like very, she's like super strong and buff and she's very confident and she's like super funny and she's beautiful, you know? But I think maybe it's just my lot in life to take people like that and turn them into repressed Asian nerds. <laughs> and the thing is like Leah is that she's, you know, so at first read, I'm like, okay, I don't think she immediately understands this character, but we talked about it. And then she took the adjustments and she took them really well. And that told me, okay, this is a smart actor, right? Um, and there's sometimes it's just a chemistry. Like you just feel a chemistry and, and it's not that there might have been another amazing actor, but I just don't have the same chemistry with that person. So if Leah, it was that where we had a lot of conversations about it and, and you're, always, you're always taking a bit of a risk, but it was just a journey I wanted to go on. And I just felt like there's something about her. Um, that I, I just think it's so special. Um, now with Daniel, uh, it's funny because again, that's a role where there were a lot of, of possible contenders of people who actually had more of a name. And I actually picked Daniel out of like a tape, like I'm watching all these tapes. And my casting director was like, how about this person? How about that person? I was like, go, no, 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 no. And I was like, who is this kid? And they're like, oh, that's just some kid. From, I'm like, no, 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 I wanna see this kid. You know, like there's just something about him. and. He, I mean, Daniel himself is very smart. Like he's very book smart. He's not like Paul in that regard, but he's exactly like Paul in that deep, honest 
goodness. Like he's so genuinely just earnest and, and kind and good. And I knew I needed someone who could, like Paul in many ways is the heart of the film that allows Ellie to sort of like, like finally, like it moves Ellie, right? Like, so I need the person who that's gonna happen with. And then when I can read them, cause it was like, okay, here's two Ellie's, here's three Paul's, we're reading everyone across from each other. And I just love their chemistry. And I know at that point in the room, I was the only one who saw it, but I was like, this is who I want. Like, this is who it is. And, um, you know, it was a risk, but once we got on the shoot and started shooting, mainly because, and, and I get it, because I think for everyone else, it was kind of like, oh, but all these other people have more experience. And I'm like, I, I knew that Daniel had a ton of talent, like just natural talent. He worked incredibly hard, but these are young actors. Like how much experience are they going to have unless they're literally Disney stars, right? And I'm not looking for that form of acting. And I just felt it with him. And I think he's, he's just so, I don't know, I, he, he's, he's so wonderful in that role. And then Alexis, which I think, and I, I've said this multiple times, I think it could be easy to just, like a lot of people see what Alexis is doing, but I think a lot of people might take it for granted because it seems like such a easy role, like she's just being natural, but it's extraordinarily hard to do what she's doing. Like it's so subtle and it's such a nonverbal performance. And you need someone like that. Like what she's doing causes us to like the other two characters more. Because right. if the love interest doesn't come across as quite, or there's something about them that's not real, you're a little bit like, why are these two ding-dongs chasing after that person? We already disrespect you, right? And Alexis, like, obviously she's beautiful, but there's some way that the way she's shows up on screen you wonder like, what is she thinking? You know, like they're, they're, like you hear an internal monologue going on for her that feels natural. Um, and yeah, that's all her. Like that's just something I think she, she, she brings to the role. That's great. Um, okay, uh, question about vending machines. I actually, we have a few questions about vending machines. So is it a coincidence that in Saving Face in both half of it, there are kind of key moments that happen in front of the vending machine? must just like vending machines. I don't really understand it. Like, it wasn't like I was thinking. I mean, I will say this again, I'm writing this thing and I'm not thinking it's ever gonna get made, right? Like, so the half of it, especially, I literally just like, like the half of it is incredibly filled with everything I love. Like all the movies in there are the movies I love. Like that, like remains the day. Like, I'm just like writing this stuff because, oh, I love that book. Like at the point I put it in there, Katsu Ishiguro hadn't won the Pulitzer Prize yet. So I didn't even realize that was about to happen. Um, there are all these, like at one point, it's like pocket dialogue off to the side, but one of the girls is talking about Taylor Swift. I totally love Taylor Swift. I, I, what can I say? Like, there's like all these little things. I love you, Colt. I literally just threw in all the things I love. I, I have a Smith Corona typewriter, you know? And, and what's so funny to me is maybe because that specificity, like for whatever weird reasons, it actually seems to have connected for, like you'd think that that would be too specific, but I'm shocked how many people connect to something that has otherwise been that, that yeah, that is that specifically me, I guess. That's great. Uh, we have a few questions about before you were a filmmaker, I have here that you worked in a tech career, computer, um, computer sciences, and then you transitioned over. Can you talk about your decision to be, to make films? Yeah, so I, I never made a decision that said, I think I'm gonna go make films because, mm. uh, and actually even today, I'm not really someone who's like, I'm a filmmaker, what film shall I make? It's like not a thing I really, well, nothing I think at all. I'm very project specific. Like if there's a project I love, I'm going to make that thing or I'm gonna try and make that thing. If there isn't a project I love, I really like happily could never make another film and that would be fine, right? Like there's no, there's actually a ton of great filmmakers out there. There's a ton of content. like. A perfect example is like I and I know this because like I love the show The Good Place or Parks and Rec. I'm never gonna be able to uh, like I can't write like that. I don't have that kind of genius. But apparently there are a whole bunch of people out there who create those kinds of things and they're out there, right? So for me, it's gonna be more like, did I come up with something that I actually think no, this is something I could do or I could do justice to in a specific way. Um, otherwise, there's there's no point. And similarly with with when I went off to make Saving Face. It really was just, I'd written this, I was a computer scientist. I was 
took a night class randomly. I ended up writing Saving Face in this night class at the University of Washington Extensions program. Um, and it wasn't until the script was done and the teacher in the class actually said, hey, I, I'm actually interested in optioning this, that I was like, I, what does that mean? And he was like, look, honestly, if I optioned your script, which I do for very little money, I would take it down to Hollywood. If it sold, it's not going to be Asian. It's not going to be gay. Um, it probably won't even get made. <laughs> you know, like that's the way Hollywood development works. But, you know, like it would be a money play. And I was like, well, if I want to make money, I'd stay in computer science. And so, but that moment of realizing someone could take something that was so personal to me made me go, fuck it, I'm gonna make, I'm gonna try and get this thing made myself. Or if I don't, then at least I really gave it a shot, right? And the other thing, so I'm a massive fear of debt. Uh, I was lucky enough to have happened to pick a career that ended up, turned out to be more lucrative than I would have expected. And so that gave me a nest egg. Um, and that nest egg, you know, allowed me to basically, it, I gave me five years. I like, I was like, all right, I'm gonna give myself five years, end of five years, if I make the film, great. If I don't, I still have six to eight months to find a job. Um, and I think that's, you know, allowed me to sort of wrap my brain around what is the risk on this. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, and, and if you had asked me, I probably would have been like, yeah, this film's probably never gonna get made, but I, I wanna at least have tried. Um, so that's, that's sort of how the thought process worked. Right. Alice, we've talked for, I think, an hour now. This <laughs> I um, so I, I do want to wrap it up. You know, obviously, uh, if you didn't see half of it tonight, you, you have an opportunity. It's on Netflix. Please check it out. Is there anything else you would want to say to the audiences? And I do apologize. We got so many questions. Uh, and my only disappointment is I'm not sharing with you all the love that is being sent your way from oh. all around the world saying oh, how much you. they enjoyed the film. So yeah, there's a lot of different countries being represented here too. So anyways, anything you'd want to say to the audience? Uh, no, I, 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 I just honestly, I'm so grateful. I, I was telling Masashi right before we started this, I've been doing a bunch of these Q&As, but I was actually particularly excited about this one because it felt like, oh good, I'm talking to like a friend and this will, and it just felt, and I remember thinking like, this will feel like home, you know, and then you sh totally shocked me by bringing like some of my family on. Um, and I just am very grateful. I'm grateful that we have this community. Um, and I hope, yeah, I, I'm excited for, there are all these new voices coming out. If any of you are out there and you think to yourself, I don't know if I can do this, but you want to, um, let me be, <laughs> let me be an inspiration as someone who didn't get her first film made till she was 34 and then like disappeared from the industry and then came back at the age of, like, I just turned 50, like two, three weeks ago. And my, I just made a movie with like teenagers in it. So <laughs> apparently anything can happen. So I want you to take that as a, it's never too late, you know? Well, thank you, Alice, so much. Um, this has been really great. I've been really happy that we get to sit and talk. And um, when you do the reunion thing this weekend, invite me to if you can, because I'd love to just listen to that. Great. Okay, uh, okay, watch, you're going to be too busy. What's going to happen is we're all going to be able to get on. You're going to be like, oh, I can't do this time. Oh, I can't. <laughs> uh, well, I should mention, this is CamFest. We still have two more days of our festival left. So we still got a lot of programs tomorrow. On Friday, we're closing with the 10th anniversary screening of Fruit Fly by uh, SF filmmaker H.P. Mendoza. Um, and that's going to be a really wild program. So anyways, thank you, Alice, again. Thank you yeah, thank all you. for participating, joining, and we'll see you at a future program. Thank you. Yes. Thank you, guys. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs>